What's this about? Can you build a temple from a text? I think in one or two of the versions I put, can you design a building from a text? Um, and maybe that, I think, so, can you build sounds better? And of course, they're two different things. To build something, you have to first design it and you have to draw it. And in the etymological sense, uh, uh, design, disegno, uh, dessin is a, is a drawing. So a drawing is a stage between the, uh, the idea and the actual building. So if you want the short answer, can you um, build a temple from a text? Yes, you can, uh, but you first have to draw it. And can you draw and design a building from a text? Uh, yes, you can but you have to know the architectural language, the architectural system, the tradition, and you have to be able to interpret the text. But the connection is not a random one. Uh, and I hope to show you by going through worked examples, using a text and arriving at a design, that um, the designs really are in the text and that the text is not some abstruse theoretical thing divorced from practice, nor is it um, something that you can be strictly followed and can tell you everything about a design. Um, and, and to understand that relationship, you really have to go through the process. So learn the architectural language, and I will tell you a few essentials so that when I go through the, uh, the, the texts, I hope you will see that I'm not just making up the design. So that's the that's the short answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the short answer. So those who are now happy with the answer can please switch off. Uh, <laughs> and those who, would, those who would like me to explain it further, please stay. Uh, the lecture will be in two parts. Uh, the, looking first at uh, South Indian Dravida architecture and, and Nagra architecture from North India in the second part. The, the texts that I'm referring to in the first part are the Manasara, the Mayamata and the Deep Agama. Manasara and Mayamata, of course, are well-known Shilpa Shastras or Vastu Shastras. And the Deep Agama is an Agama, a ritual text, which, like many of these, contains uh, considerable portions about architecture. All of these texts ha um, have been published and uh, Manasara and Mayamata translated into English. But I have found uh, uh, that one needs to work with a Sanskritist unless one Sanskrit is good enough, which mine isn't. So I've been working with Sanskritists on new translations of these texts. And working together, you find that the text, the translation um, can be done literally, but you, then you have to refine it and modify it in relation to the designs that are contained in the text. So you can, it, it's a two way process. It's not just somebody does the translation and then you understand the architecture. You've got to understand something about the architecture in order to fully understand the text. Now, drawings from uh, Shastras, Vastu, Vastu Shastras, Shilpa Shastras, have not been done enough. Strangely enough, or interestingly enough, the very first. Uh, modern uh, scholarship on temple architecture in India. Ram Raz's uh, Temple Architecture of the Hindus, published in 1834, contains some very good drawings done from portions of the Manasara yeah. that Ram Raz and his, his uh, practitioner collaborators were able to get hold of and understand in their own style, but they, they, they really did understand the relationship between the text and the practice. A hundred years later, when uh, P.K. Acharya did his monumental series of works on Manasara, 
he didn't realize that the Manasara was a South Indian text of maybe something like 10th or 11th century, but took it as the kind of ore text, the Vitruvius of Indian architecture. Um, and his collaborator, collaborator who was an engineer did these wonderful uh, sort of uh, art deco buildings, which uh, anyone can see now don't look like South Indian temples. So, like I say, you have to know the language, the architectural language. So a few, a lot of you do now from this course know a lot about South Indian temples. And, uh, but here, I, I want to tell you some basics which we need to bear in mind when looking at the text. So very early uh, wooden prototypes existed. We can tell from relief carvings and paintings at Ajanta and so on, that uh, wooden buildings existed, which were the prototypes of Dravida architecture. Uh, two basic sorts, one with a, a kuta on top, a square, well, square or circular domed pavilion, and another type uh, often seen in gateways, which has a rectangular shala on the top. And this, these prototypes were translated into stone or into brick, monumentalized, not copying the wooden forms, but uh, translating them into a language of monumental masonry. So the, the most basic Dravida temples, as you probably know, are call, called Ekatala, one story temples. And in, the, in, in Tamil Nadu, in the far south of India, the principal way of varying these is simply to vary the shape of the plan, square, rectangular, apsidal, circular, octagonal, or alternatively, var um, varying simply the top, the kuta or the shala, or the, the, and the, 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 basically the roof form. So you can have a circular uh, kuta roof on the square base, and so on. Then there are vertical divisions that we need to know about when looking at the text. This kind of uh, alpa vimana, simple vimana, ektala, one, one story vimana, is conceived of as having six divisions, six angas or vargas. It's uh, sat anga or sat varga. A molded base or adhistana, a wall called stamba or pada, and the word the terms vary. Then a prastara, which is sometimes translated as, as entablature, which is uh, over the wall. Then a kanta or gala or griva, a neck, which often is understood to contain the Vedika molding, the Vedi molding, which represents a railing, then the shikara, which is the roof, and then the stupika, which is the finial. So bear in the mind those six divisions. And you can have simple vimanas still considered or, or classified as, as ekatala, one story, which have three conceptually three stories you can see already the the one on the left has a kuta on top of a wall which is kind of like two stories this is kind of like three stories but it it is can still considered a one story vimana it'll maybe become clear as we go along but that is that basically is uh, one of those one of the ones on the left which has become the superstructure of something with one extra prastara, and one extra stamba. Now, as things develop, the temple becomes multi-story, and it becomes multi-edicular. The, the one temple develops from being a single unit, a single house for the god, to being a multi-storied palace of the gods made up of many little temples. 
many small houses for the different manifestations or aspects or subordinates or or, or um, of of the main deity. There may or may not be pilasters in the wall, but the when there are, it's particularly explicit that the elements, the building blocks of this divine palace are themselves images of that basic Ekatala Vimana or Alpa Vimana. We have a fat one of those on the top and a slender one of those on the corners and Shala topped edicules in the middle. But there's another, yet another way, uh, at, um, dimension we need to look at, and that is the mouldings. The base, uh, Adhisthana, is itself made up of several mouldings, and we shall see presently that you get alternative choices for different types of Adhisthana. Then we have the wall itself with the pilasters uh, made of stone or brick, but representing those timber posts that go back to the wooden prototypes, with uh, brackets and a beam at the top, and then a kaputa, which is um, a thatched eave, originally. Then a prati, sometimes a viala mala, when it's got vialas in, and makaras and other creatures all, all over it. But however many creatures, it, it represents a wooden floor with the ends of timber joists. And then, optionally, but usually, a vedi, vedika, which is a railing to stop people upstairs falling out, then a griva or a neck, the inha inhabitable part of the upper pavilion, and then the shikara or the roof with its finials or stupikas uh, on top. In the case of a shala, three or more, several stup stupikas lined up. So the shala is the pavilion on the top, of this unit, um, and we have a, the the shala, the kuta, and the third um, basic element, which is the panjara, which is like a shala taken through ninety degrees, and you see the horseshoe gable on the end. We can argue about whether it's conceived as a rectangular one embedded or as an apsidal one embedded. You can't see what's behind anyway, but it's, of course, in the imagination, there is a three-dimensional form embedded within the body of the temple. So that seems pretty clear. And those are the units uh, making two stories, but one tala, two imaginary stories in that there is a pavilion on the top, but one tala or bumi of the Vimana or Prasada of the temple. But just to complicate things, there's this other way of looking, which we've already touched on, where you have the different Angas or Vargas, in which case the Adhisthana is one, the Stamba the pad, the, or Pada is the wall, and the Prastara is the beam at the top of the wall, the the Bhuta Mala or uh, Hamsa Mala or whatever kind of uh, garland of thing, if creatures you have uh, underneath the overhanging eaves of the Kapota. The Kapota itself, the thatched eaves with its gable windows, little places looking out, and the Prati or Viala Mala, which is the floor. So that you need to understand that definition of prastara uh, to understand which bit the texts are talking about when they give you the size of the prastara. And when they talk about one tala or bhumi, one story, they usually give you the height of the, the wall and the height of the prastara and they leave it to the architect, or you, you need to know, the architect needs to know that there's the rest of the kuta or the shala needs to go on top of that. And of course, you can have three-story elements, 
like this, like the uh, the uh, Ashta Varga Alpa Vimana, which can become the main elements in the wall. So um, the thing on the left becomes the superstructure of a a, a, a more complex element. And once you understand uh, this, it's very easy in looking at a temple elevation to describe the composition reasonably succinctly. This has got a round kuta topped uh, alpa vimana on the top, and then the second tala is made up of kuta, shala, shala, kuta. The first tala, adi tala, has kuta, panjara, shala, panjara, kuta. And the, these wonderful um, photogrammetric models that I am showing have been made by uh, my friend and colleague Kailash Rao in various projects that we have done together. They give you a, a true elevation without having to climb up and measure every little bit, which is very useful if you're trying to compare, for example, proportions given in a text and proportions in actual practice. Now, we're moving on now to the to, uh, texts. Now you understand the, the language. These are from the uh, Mayamata. And like uh, the other texts, we are given a whole variety of different Adistanas uh, to choose from. And all, it, it, all along you'll find, especially in these southern texts, you're given the, the architect is given a choice. You could have this or that or that. Within the, the framework, you're given these choices. And one of the choices is what kind of Adistana are we going to have? Now, be careful when you read something like the Encyclopedia of Indian Temple Architecture, where they say, where they label um, a page or they, they label a photo of, a, of a, an Adhistana and it says, this is a Sri Bandha or this is a Shreni Bandha or Padma Bandha, because they never tell, they don't tell you which text they got these terms from. And with terminology, it's so fluid and different texts use different terms for the same type. And moreover, different texts, and even within the same texts, you can find different words for the same thing. So you, if you look at the rounded molding there, the ku, which uh, is a kumuda, can, can be three-faceted, but all, these all, the examples in my little sketches are all round, you can see the different names, kumuda, kairawa, Abja, Vrta Vapra, Kumuda, Ashta, Ashtash, Vravrapa, and Vrta Kumba. So, although there's about five different names for the same element. And you might say, well, it's just because uh, Adam didn't know the meaning of those words, so he just drew a round thing. Uh, <laughs> but I would, I hope to convince you that. Uh, it's not it's not that because once you twig what the text is talking about you follow uh, it, it, it you follow its logic and you will find that um you have to know more it's not a matter of knowing the word and applying the word it's a matter of knowing the architecture and knowing what the word means from the context may not be convinced but anyway the, the uh the, these all you'll notice that they don't have the neat divisions that i showed you earlier between different courses where each course is a different molding that remains the, the fact but the, the the text labels every single little sub molding so uh in, in your in your mind you have to make sense you have to get the idea of what they mean and draw it accordingly. But I think when we look at the overall design, this will become clearer. Now, one difference between North and, Northern and Southern texts is the way they describe the designs of different temple types. 
In the northern ones, which we'll look at in the second half of the lecture, as you see on the left, they always start with a plan. So they start with a square and they say divide it into a number of parts. And that is the um, talamana, the measurement of the, the plan. And then having given you the plan, they move on to the elevation, the urva mana, the upper measurement, and you go from the bottom up. You, if you look, if you expect that in the South Indian texts, you don't find that. You'll find they go straight into, usually go straight into telling you about the the widths of the wall, and then they go into into the height. They don't give you a, a square plan and start from there. You have to look at the passages where they give you a lot of options for the width of the size of the sanctum, the height of the proportional height of the temple in relation to the width. So so there uh, from the Mayamata, you could uh, the proportion of width to height could be one third, one to three, three to five, four to seven, five to nine, six to eleven, seven to thirteen, eight to fifteen, nine to seventeen, one to two, or the rest has gone behind the pictures on the left. I can't read, but uh, you know, so you get a lot of choices. And moreover, in a different place in the same text, they can they say there are four different heights. Paushtika, Sashantika, and so on, two to three, seven to ten, four to seven, and one to two. And other texts will give you different options. So basically it's saying there's a lot of freedom in within the, the recipe to modulate it with different heights. So you have to find out for a given design which height is going to look good and which one is going to look silly. So now I'm going to we come to an actual worked example. Uh, it's a, a temple type called the Svastika from the Dipt Agama. So we'll go through it and I will draw it as we go along. So it starts, th th these um, translations are done by Libby Mills. Uh, we work together on, on this. So, there's this, 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 this type starts with the measurement of the breadth, and it says the breadth is five hastas. Now, hastas is a, an absolute measurement. It's, I think it's, it's a, a cubit. It's sort of about two feet. But usually, that's a separate issue, the actual size. What we're mainly concerned with is the proportional size between the, the relative size between the different parts. So forget the five hastas. Uh, it's about, it's a small temple about 10 feet square. Forget that. It uh, says divide it into six parts. The breadth of the kuta is one part. The length of the shala is two. The hara is one part and adorned with a hara panjara. Now, so we've got these six parts. And hara in modern scholarship is what they often call the harantara, the bit in between. But in the, 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 what I found that usually the term, more usual term is hara, which in modern scholarship means the, the whole chain of elements. But hara here, clearly from the context, it means the recess, the bit in between. Uh, and the hara panjara. Well, let's draw, let's draw the kutas and shalas, because we know they're going to be up at the top of the first tala. Incidentally, we we also know this is going to be a two a dvi tala, a two two tala vimana, because we've already been told that. So we know that these. It mentions Kuta Shala. We know it's going to be on the top of the wall. So let's draw those first. And it's very interesting that these widths are conceived in terms of the Kutas and Shalas at the top, which kind of um, 
confirms that they're thinking of the whole wall with its crowning elements, whether or not there are pilasters in the wall. The wall is, is um, proportioned according to those things on the top. So we've got couteau of one at either end, a, a recess of one in between, a shala of two in the middle, and those little things in the recesses are the panjaras, the kind of panjaras that we find in a recess rather than the primary element. So now we've got the, the we've got the widths and we go into the heights. One should divide the temple height into 28 parts. So 28. And parts, the term it can is often the, the term used for the part is often bhaga, of sometimes amsha. Um, and uh, Bada, different terms, and they all mean the same thing. You don't have, they're not like feet and inches, they, they are simply parts. So you start with an overall number of parts, and then it's divided and apportioned to the different elements. So divide the temple height into 28 parts. The Adhisthana is three parts. Okay, so we'll start with three like that. Uh, we, so happens that the Dipta Agama only tells us one kind of Adhisthana. So, okay, we've been given the dimension, the proportions of that somewhere else in the text. So, okay, no choice. We, we, we'll draw that. The upper level. Now, does that mean the whole temple or what does it mean the whole first dollar, you have to work out, you have to try things out, sketching it and see what looks right. And then you have to look ahead. We, and you see we've got the prastara. So this upper level they're talking about is the, the pillar level, the wall itself, which um, can contain a Vedi. I've drawn it with a Vedika included within that uh, within that portion uh, that's how i've interpreted it interpreted it it um then the prastara is two parts now remember the prastara is the um is that set of moldings there which is creates a kind of entablature the the beam the uh, the molding under the kapota the kapota itself and the prati or the floor so that's the first tala, but we mustn't forget. And the next bit, um, is five parts. Did I get mod did I get out of order here? Probably, I probably did. The the adhistana is three parts. The wall height is six parts. The prastara is three parts, and the upper level is this thing, this thing, the second tala. But we mustn't forget the kutas and shalas of the first tala, which we can now add because we did them at the beginning. The prastara of the second tala is two parts. The vedika is one part. And in this case, the vedika and the griva are given as separate things rather than combined rather than the Vedika being uh, subsumed within the Griva. So Vedika is one and the Griva is two. Then we are told the wise man should make the Shikara height four parts above that. The Shikara is the roof, we put there it is, and the remainder is the stupi. And since we have uh, 28 parts, we know that the remainder is two, and that is the stupi. And then we're very pleased because it all adds up and it fits together. Sometimes there are problems and sometimes we have to go back again and try again and work it out if it, and work out whether we went wrong or whether the text has some inconsistency in it. But always it's the... 
the actual practice of the tradition has to override the text, surely, because if it looks completely wrong, it's not that the, the, that all the temples ever built were wrong, it's that there's something either in the uh, interpretation of the text or in the text itself, which must be anomalous. Now, we, uh, in, in, following that passage on the swastika, we're given a variation, and this is this is very typical that you you go you move on from one design to another, and you rather than having to give all the instructions for e each time, the text will tell you. Um, now we add this, or we take away that, or you do this, or you do that, and you had you have to understand that it's taking the previous one for granted. And it's doing some variations on that. So we get a sequence of designs. And I should have said that in this, the, the typical thing in a South Indian text is that you go from one tala up to 12. Even though not many temples above three talas were built, of course, we have exceptions like Rihadeshvara, Tanjavur, and so on. But um, those are rare. But in the, in, in the theoretical idea is that you go from one to 12. And within each of those, within the, the one story, the two story, the three story, and so on, we have these different choices. So uh, Kailasha is, a, is a, a, a different elaboration of the two story temple. It's divided into 34, uh, still six in the plan, and it has an octagonal shikara or dome and it has a a, a a torana in the wall and it has a projection at the center we can now go on and, and compare uh what the what a text says with actual practice and say yes we can design we can draw a design from the text but did does that mean that people actually followed it and uh the answer is, uh, I think, well, they're, they're, it's all coming from the same tradition. They're not slavishly following texts. And you'll rarely find uh, a temple that exactly follows a particular text, but you will find the same kind of principles um, applied. And you will find that by going through the texts and the way they think about designs, it will help you to analyze actual designs because you know what you're looking for. So we know with these, uh, if we're looking, for example, the, the wonderful Muvara coil at Kodum Valor, originally three temples um, to survive, one, one at the center, uh, two, either, two either side. And we find it divides I can't read the bottom of the screen because I've got a finger across it, but what does it say? It's, it's, it's however many divisions at the bottom. And it, this, you can make it work. You, you realize that you have to make it work for whole numbers or fractions or simple fractions, half, quarter, three quarters, or, uh, or so on. But surprisingly, 34, although it's not the universal rule for two-story vimanas in the text, we do find that 34 divisions of the height um, is uh, is quite is a common enough um, way of doing it. We find it as, as well at the temple at Kulambando, 10th century temple, about 100 years after Kodumbalor. And in this case, the bhaga, the part of the plan, seems to be the same one used for the 34 of the height. Now that little line, dotted line that you can see that I've drawn on there, that isn't in the text, but I found that this seems to work. That, and it's why it's important to know the divisions that the texts talk about. Remember that division called the prastara. Well, that the and then the, the second tala starts from the top of the prastara, but we can't actually see that it's hidden inside 
the stone, but it's there as a controlling principle, which all goes to show that drawings are an important step between the written text and the actual design. You have to draw what the text is talking about, and then you can make a scale drawing or a full size drawing, and you can take dimensions off that when you're building the temple. Now, quickly to, to, to round off this first part, uh, I'll look at the Maya Mata and its instructions for um, temples with five or, or no, four or more talas or stories. And we'll look at the one for five talas. I'm not going to show you the text, but just whiz through the principles. It says, because once it's described in detail, uh, the one story, two story, three story, and so on, it becomes very, it, it gives you only very basic rules for the subsequent ones. And I think this is, this highlights uh, one of the uh, essential purposes of these texts, which is not to say you have to do it like this, but to transmit to the apprentice architects and craftsmen the understanding of the language. And once you've understood those earlier ones, when, when we, we, can, we can then work out all these other details for ourselves when we come to uh, a basic framework like this. So we're told the height is 48 and the, 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 the story heights and the prastaras are five and a half, two and a half, five and a quarter, two and a half, five, two and a quarter, and so on. So we can draw that. And we're told that the, the bottom is divided into nine, 10 or 11 parts. But we're, no, we're not told how many parts to divide the upper stories into. So I'm just going to try and interpret it and see if I can come out with something decent. So I've chosen to do to draw this at one to one and a half. The height is one and a half times the width, probably because it fits on the on the paper. But it, we'll see if it looks good. And I've drawn the the prastaras uh, along that line so that they line up. Uh, the bottom of the the bottom of each tala happens at those points where the little lines go up. So let's put a a, a single unit on top and divide it into three and give it a projection in the middle. But, and having started off on that track, we can't, the, the choice for the next one down is not infinite because it has to fit nicely. The middle projection mustn't be narrower than the one above. So let's try seven and let's try, how about, yeah, that's good. The shala will be good, a good proportion. And how about if in the recesses, we put some of these, that this type of banjara that, that doesn't go all the way up, just for a bit of variety. We won't, we'll, it, doesn't, it doesn't go all the way up, but it, its head stops in the kaputa. And then, you know, fiddle around, see what works. Well, eight seems to work. And we can have full full scale panjaras uh, in between the kuta and the shala. Same. Let's do the same pattern here. See if it works. Yes, the shala will be wider, um, and getting quite wide the shala there. But I think it still works. Yeah, it still looks quite nice. We can fiddle around. Um, get it but it look i think that's okay but now what are the about at the bottom now we're limited because they told us nine ten or eleven parts uh nine looks a little bit too wide the shala could work eleven well that's no good because the shala is the is virtually the same width as the one above and we want it to be expanding up expanding down or contracting up so let's try 10 oh that looks okay 
that's fine. Ten is fine. Um, we could we could put the whole thing up on a on on a on a pita on a on a on a sub base that would give it a bit of extra height. Anyway, there we are. Is that my that's my five um, story temple? Sorry, the Maya Mata's five story temple, as interpreted. And we can compare it with. Let's find uh, there aren't so many five story temples, but the the, the famous royal mid uh, royal temple mid mid twelfth century uh, Chola temple, uh, the Airavateshvara at Darasoram, will fit the bill. It stands on a pita sub a sub base, so it gives it an extra height. Um, it has Ashtavarga. Kuta and Shala and Panjara units in the first two talas, so it gives it an extra grandeur over the other one on the left. Uh, and it has some, some interesting variations like some um, apsidal shalas turned sideways in the recesses at the top, and it has little, little uh, circular kutas standing on the um, the platform around the main dome, as well as little nandi bulls. We can look at the proportions and find it seems to work very well if you divide the the wall and and notice that the it, the, the plan division does happen in the wall zone itself, not in the Vedi Banda, which is different from Nagara temples, as we shall see in the second half. And it seems to use the same module for the height, but it's not it's not some clear uh, one and a half or two. 91 to 50, whatever whatever proportion that is. But I think we we can say that um, on the basis of finding whole fractions, that that seems to be what the conception is. And if we like, we could um, make our five-story Vimana a little bit more slender, like uh, the Aravateshvara, by saying let's let, instead of one and one to one and a half, let's make it uh, one to two. The height is twice the width. Easy with Photoshop, except it's made my Nazis, my horseshoe arches, a little bit too thin. Well, that's the end of uh, South India, and we I th think we said we would have a five minute break. If that's okay. Yes, yes. But Adam, Adam, yes. Nija, mm -hmm. would you like to take uh, the questions for the Dravida also at the end? Uh, wouldn't that get very confusing? Oh, if you, I, I thought at the end, but if, but uh, I don't mind. You tell me. Because if the language is, I mean, unless we're using the same oh, language, yeah, okay. I, just, no, I, 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 I thought it's better. I think yeah, it's better I'm... that we do Dravida and Nagara separately. Oh, okay, Nija. that's fine. Nija, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Very much so. Would you um, like to okay. do that? Sure, if Adam, because Adam had said initially at the end, but sure. Um, I haven't right. written anything down yet. That's the problem. Uh, I mean, no but questions. But if you have something. You I have think plenty. Of questions. No, no, I have plenty. I have <laughs> plenty. I've been making notes. So, Adam, may I shoot off? Yes, please. So, to begin with, you said Vastu and Shilpa Shastras. Are they synonymous? It, it... Where are the overlaps? There, there isn't anything, uh, there isn't any authoritative uh, ancient uh, uh, explanation of what you should call these things. Uh, and both, mm -hmm. both terms are there. Uh, okay. A Shilpa Shastra, of course, means a, 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 a craft, a shastra, a treatise on craft or art. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. And Vastu is specifically architecture. Um, but, uh, and I think in modern scholarship, we t we like to have a neat category and we like, and, and, and it's fair enough to say an architectural text is a Vastu shastra, um, a more general text is a, is a shilpa, is a shilpa um, one about sculpture, but of course there's so there's so much mixture in all of them, uh, of, of mixtures of both as well as of mm. ritual and 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 theology mm. and 
and and and all kinds of other things in there that it's that I it, you don't really find pure Shilpa Shastras or Vastu Shastras or right. so and 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 you know Manasara Shilpa Shastra isn't it called that uh, one of the titles of Manasara? That's my next question. Oh, so, so what are Manasara, Maya, Mata, and Dita Gama? What are, what would they be? They'd be Vastu or Shilpa? Ah, or... Yeah, I, I think uh, it, Manasara is often referred to. I think in Acharya's. Uh, publications, I think it's referred to as Manasara Shilpa Shastra. I've heard that term anyway, but um, I suppose strictly it's more about architecture, so we should call it a Vastu Shastra um, and Maya Mata as well. Deep Agama is an Agama, so it's it, with, an Agama with some architectural sections in it. In it. So that's something else. I think uh, the earlier, the earliest architectural texts were in te general religious texts like Agamas, mm -hmm. um, and in the earlier ones, we find much more general uh, instructions about the shape and the height, the overall proportions. Um, it's only when, when you get to around the 10th and 11th centuries mm -hmm. when these these from when these specialized uh, architectural and craft texts or certainly architectural survives that um texts so survive um and it's only then that that you there's there's enough detail to draw the to draw the buildings in in detail Right. It's also, I think there must have been a proliferation of the texts at that time, because it's also the moment when uh, different regional traditions are getting knowledge of other traditions right. and conscious, right. consciously combining. And you have the Samarangana Sutradhara, which is where uh, the Raja Bhuj is deliberately getting texts from different traditions north south mm -hmm. middle and putting them all in one big vol voluminous uh, encyclopedic text yeah uh, and also with the day uh, maya mata is 12th century or is it earlier uh, yeah. it's it's probably 10th or 11th 10th or but, 11th. but, but it, they, they of course all these texts got copied and recopied and sometimes you get later editions mm -hmm. in them and sometimes you get early mm -hmm. very old passages revered passages right. inside an 11th century text so mm -hmm. um you have to be critical and try to figure out wh mm -hmm. which bits are from different dates but i i really do think and i hope that by going through this uh that you, I hope, I hope you can see that yeah. uh, the, the, they do fit. Uh, a, a given text does is of its time and does fit right. the architecture of its time, and that's kind of how you suddenly, me as an architect, that, that's how I work oh, out right. work out the likely date of a text because of the architecture it describes. Other right. people would look at the philology the, the script and the the terminology and other things yeah. no doubt and and the other thing is that when you say agamas i mean are these shaiva agamas what agamas are they uh the these they would be uh, for some sect there, right there, are, some... There, there were there were shaiva agamas that libby mills has her, her book is on the some early shaiva, 7th century mm. shaiva agamas which mm. include um, early uh, instructions on temples. Uh, these, where the, but I don't think the Diptagama. I need to. I need to check up on it. Yeah, but yeah, I, no, it, no, it, it, big. But, I mean, I don't think it is specific. It's, I don't think it's sh uh, Shaiva uh, strictly. Mm -hmm. Shaiva, because they, it they, it has things like you know this this temple is suitable for any god. Uh, a, a lot of them are quite 
un uh, unsectarian in that they, they are they're, they're telling they're talking about architecture which can be for Shiva Vishnu can be for, for, they tell you how to do a Jain temple uh, or they say this could also be for the Jains or it's particularly good for Jain temples and right. later on even you know later on you start even to get mosques coming in <laughs> in the fifth. 15th century or so so um it's certainly not one thing is very clear is that um a given type of temple mm. while they may say this is dear to uh shiva or to surya or whatever it, it it's not that that you know the, the same temple design could can be used for different be, gods that's very clear and my two more questions. Uh, when you say you said about, I think it was a Kodambalu temple. When you said you, the temple height, when it should be divided into twenty eight. Uh, How did the first one you said was divided into twenty eight? Yes, and then the second one thirty eight, and and uh, I just happened, yeah, but, happened to found to find three examples where thirty eight. Uh, yeah, but if it is twenty eight, if you say it's twenty eight, you divide it by twenty eight. What do you? How do you begin with the height in the first place? You say ah, the temple height. That, that's an important question. It, there's you have to distinguish between the actual height and yes. the proportional height. Now, it, 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 you you often in another place you'll be told uh, this kind of temple can be so many hastas or so you uh, mm. you can have a small version and it's this mm. size, the middling, middling version is this size, big version is this size. But the temple, the shikara height, the whole height. And the shikara height, yeah. But, and, and if it's one to two, that will give you the shikara height. Yeah. But but but, but it, it doesn't, re to draw the design, it doesn't really matter what okay. scale you're drawing at. In, okay. in other words, you know, you can have exactly that thing, uh, that drawing on the left, it mm. could be a little thing mm. that big, or it could be as big as uh, mm. Daras mm. or mm. Mm. The, the same. Mm. In, if you see what I mean, there, there's, a, there's a, the actual dimension and the but the proportions. Mm. The proportions are separate from the actual size. Yeah, that yes, and and what is the basic unit the hasta based on? Ah, uh, hasta is. It's it's there's the angle ang, angular is, which is a, is that isn't it and yes. isn't it uh, isn't that has to twenty four what what we understood is like it's the patron it's like it yeah. starts with the it starts with the uh, with the uh, uh, with yeah in the center and your yeah. and and comes down to your hand so it's half it's like that that's the hasta that's the hasta or it could be just this it could be just a span well, with, I don't yes. It could be either. It could be either, but but from <laughs> I, it, <laughs> no, it's, it's I was not, just wondering. It, yeah, but it, it in the, for this purpose, there's no need to get hung up about the mm. actual size because yes, it's, it's the relative proportion. Size. Exactly, the yeah, proportion is size. what counts. Correct, correct. I think there are whole Nisha. You can take over, please. The whole bunch from the, in the chat. Yeah, there's tons of questions. And um, just to go over some of them that are related, yeah, one was just answered, were Angulas used as a question? Um, uh, Living the and sketches, I was wondering how and why the names Swastika and Kailasha were assigned to the particular ratios you went to describe. Are there any mentions of the reasons in the texts, in the DA, I guess? There, there, there are no mentions of um why particular names are given um but there and the na there are certain kinds of names that are popular names of flowers names of mountains Kai kailash and so on um meru uh the uh Svastika is is a popular name sarvato badra meaning beautiful on all sides is a popular mm -hmm. name and the thing to know is that um, it's this is a different kind of typological label from, let's say, Nagra Dravida or um, 
or Valabi or Bumija or what, whatever. Uh, it, this is the name of a particular design within one of those systems. So you can have a Nagara temple called Svastika, and a Dravida temple called Svastika. And between two texts, you can have a, complete, a completely different Dravida temple called Svastika in one text from in another text. You could eat um, the Samarangana Sutradhara, which assembles texts from different places, probably has about, four, if you read the whole thing, there are probably about five different um, Kailasa temples in that mm. text, meaning completely different things. So these are popular temple names. They might, they're not, it's no good saying to an architect, you haven't built a Kailasa temple because I've got a book that says that Kailasa temple looks like that. I think the the reason to, to answer the question of why uh, Kailasa is because it's a mountain and it's Shiva's home and it's a good name. Temples are like mountains. It's a very good name for a temple. And um, Svastika is an auspicious symbol, isn't it? And the, uh, you, it's an, also a popular name for a temple type. But they never tell you why this particular one is given to this particular type. Ujwala is asking that she once heard from a scholar that Gungai Kunda Cholapuram temple, the height and breadth proportions went wrong during the building process and the sthapatis had to create a bulge in the shikara to account for the errors. Is that your reading as well? Uh, I, I don't know, though I, I, I do think there's a very, there is a sort of, subtle um, change of plan from circular to down to square mm -hmm. in, in the in in the tower which seems to have been thought out uh, and isn't entirely clear but it's there if you look for it i don't know whether that's the result of a, a mistake i don't think so i do think there was a change of plan in the brihadeshvara tanjavur which not people don't usually mention in, in that it starts going up like this and then about then several stories up the angle changes and it goes like that now i think because, i think that's because they got to here and they thought oh my god if we carry on like that it will be about 2 miles high and we, and we haven't got the money or we haven't got the stone or we could, we don't know if it'll stand up so they uh, oh well so they changed the angle a little bit and they went on like that. That's what I think. So I think the answer is yes for Tanjavu. Uh, don't um, know for Ganga from the Chulapuram. Uh, Antoinette is asking, what do you make of the five Rathas in Mahabalipuram? It's often claimed that they are examples of temple styles. And do they follow any of these Shastrik uh, texts? Uh, they are uh, they're earlier than they're the, the, that period when as I was saying, we don't, the texts, um, the texts that we have don't give so much detail that you could say they follow or they don't follow or they partially mm -hmm. follow or they don't. Um, examples of temple styles, I would say temple types, I mean, depends how you define style, but temple, temple types all within that Dravida language of the time. Um, and they... They, they, they're certainly doing, whether or not they were intended to be put in worship or not, I think they probably were. Some people think they were like a pattern book, but I think they were probably going to be t going to be real temples. But in any case, they there's no doubt about it that they do, in a beautiful way, they do the typical thing of showing the variations in shape and, and composition using a common language which is which is what you find all over but you find it is very beautifully done there and it, it's it's also what the texts are often doing they're they're giving you the 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 they're giving you different imaginative possibilities within a given system mm-hmm Um, I mean, we did talk about the Agamas 
to some extent. Um, I believe they were used for the placement of images around the temple, Rhoda is asking. Were they also used as architectural text? Did they have philosophical bits in them as well, the Agamas? I think the answer is yes to all those. They had philosophical bits, a lot of ritual bits, and uh, some of them have architectural bits in them. Mm -hmm. And there's... I'm wondering whether you think these texts, particularly the later ones, existed first and architects followed them, or if maybe some of the texts were written based on what their authors observed in the already built temple. Ah, so well, that's chicken one of and the, egg. That's one of the basic questions, isn't it? And and um, and and that's why we need to. Yeah, you can only answer the question by I'm hoping to show by actually doing it. You uh, actually see getting into the skin of the architects or trying to and um, trying to design from the text. Because before we can answer the question, we first of all have to know, is it possible? Can you build a temple from a text? That's what we're talking about. OK, yes, you can. Uh, at least you can design it and then go on to build it. Um, does that mean that people did? Well, mm. by looking at these comparisons, you see they use, they're using the same principles, and we may be able to find a text that is a temple uh, that exactly follows a text. I've never found one yet in plan, yes, but in plan and elevation, I've never yet found one. Um, but even if we did find one, which would it, which came first? And in a way, it's a kind. I, I think it's it's the obvious question. It's a big question, but it's a false question because they. They come out of the same milieu, the same tradition. They're the same way of thinking. They aren't. In, and in any case, practice has to come first. You know, you, they didn't write these texts with no architectural in the, the vacuum. The language had to be there for the before they could write the text because they're they're imagining something very specific uh, that they didn't just come out of someone's. Head. They, they aren't inventing the whole thing and then saying, go ahead, you this, these are the rules, go and go and build it. So of course the buildings came first. But then after that, it's the two sides of the, the same coin, part of the same tradition, some of the same people uh, are, de are designing buildings and writing texts, and they they develop together. Um the texts it, some some build it texts will give a framework which people will follow to build buildings. And then the, the people, the, 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 the builders, the design, the architects will think of new ideas and start building other things. And then the text will catch up and, 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 and describe those. But then the text can also think ahead because the, the system itself has a, a potential, has a, has um, possibilities within it. So the tech, the people writing the texts, who aren't just writing, they're designing at the same time. They're saying, oh, look, you could also try out this, you could try out that. So these are potential designs and we'll describe that. And then someone will look at that and oh, we'll try and build that. And there's a new challenge. We've got to under draw it and then build it. So it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's a back and forth as soon as the texts and the architectural traditions get go going, it's it's um, a, a kind of dialectic relationship between the two. I hope that makes sense. No, I, and I think that's a very nice way of looking at it. That they would all come out of the same milieu, and it's um, it's it's that, and they were created together, almost looking at each other. Um, I think there's one more question and then we'll take a break, Adam. If the texts give any insight into the process of construction in any way. Uh, also a good question because uh, it, 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 it's, and I'm sure it's prompted by the observation that um, what I've been showing is about drawing and about designs and proportions and composition but not about uh, going to the quarry and cutting stone and how to transport it and 
and how to carve it and all of all of those what materials to use and all of those things nor what kind of workmen um there's a little bit about that but you know how how not about the economy not about the organization of the site there's sometimes it, the, the, some of these aspects are touched on in different different parts of the text but the you were you can't there's a limit to what you know there's an awful lot that they don't tell you about the process of construction they're more to do with design and to do with drawing they're conceived in terms of drawing you in so they they're crucial you can see how texts and drawings together and i hope to come on to that in the second half are are at least drawings and which relate to texts are crucial in in the construction process for uh for um for making details and and in, in encapsulating uh, d dimensions um and so on but it's that it's that aspect that uh, the texts are mainly concerned with, rather than the practicalities of uh, of material and 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 an actual making. Welcome to the second half, where I'm going to um, continue asking the question: Can you build a temple from a text? This time, looking at Nagara architecture in northern India. And again, the answer is yes. Um, so turn off now if that's enough and stay here if you would like a full explanation. Now, as we were saying earlier, it's around the 10th and 11th centuries that Vastu Shastra texts, at least the ones that have come down to us, begin to talk about temple designs in lots of detail enough detail for us not always but very often uh, if we know the architectural language concerned to be able to draw the designs of which the texts speak uh, it's around that time that um, north indian nagara temple architecture is developing or has already begun to develop from the simple Latina uh, spire that we see here into a composite kind of Nagara temple, uh, which we can term anik, anik andaka, not, not with uh, one limb or egg, a multiple composite form. The Latina form that you see here itself has a long history and many complexities which we're not going to go into because in the texts we are concerned mainly with um, the composite type though latina types are of course the basis of the more complicated nagara so what's happening in the already in the eighth and certainly through the ninth and definitely in the tenth century is that the single latina is becoming composite and we already have um, a development of the temple wall which is increasingly stepping out and which is increasingly has recesses between the different projections so in the case of a uh, five projection uh, temple wall we have these uh, different elements and once again i would remind you that the terms are very fluid and very varied and the, the same term will use be used in different ways in different texts and the, the, a given text will use different terms for the same element but let's give them names and let's give them the some names that um modern scholarship is used to but bear in mind that you won't always find the same names in texts um so the the the, the will we, we find that the corner 
is very often called the governor. The central projection is usually called the Bhadra. And in a five projection wall, we have two Karnas, Bhadra in the middle and two intermediate elements, which are often called a Pratirata. Now, there are different terms for the things we put on top. Now, in these composite temples, Anekandaka temples, the, the most characteristic uh, thing to put on top of a projection is a little shikara, a small Latina shikara. In the texts, that can be called a kuta, it can call, be called a rata, a ratika. In the text we'll be looking at uh, today, the Aparajita Pracha, a 12th century text from Western India. The term that is usually employed for these elements is a shrunga. So they'll say on top of the, in this case, they, it would say on top of the karna, there is, is a shrunga, which is a little, a little Latina shikara like that. And um, not always explicit, but sometimes often explicit through the pillar mouldings that are there at the top of the wall. This the projection plus the little shikara on top need to be read as a single unit, uh, which is a kuta stamba, a, a pillar with a kuta or a shringa or a little shikara on the top. So just as in South Indian architecture, we mustn't separate the kutas and shalas on top from the wall below. So in Nagara architecture, we, we need to read the thing as a whole and not make it all into bits so that we lose the sense of the whole composition. Sometimes instead of a, a shringa or a little shikara, in Western India especially, we have something which in the Aparajita Pracha is usually referred to as a tilaka, which is a small little pavilion like that, which is the basis of those complicated Samvarana roofs that we see on Western Indian mandapas. And look, if you look on the left, you see, you'll see that I've drawn some red lines. And this is quite important when looking at the texts, to know that the plan, when they start with the plan, they are talking about the plan at the lowest level of the molded base, which in northern terminology is called the Vedi Banda. Uh, and the lowest level of that is, the lowest element is a kumbha with a hoof, a little toe at the bottom, which is called a kura or a hoof. And the, the plan, when, it, when, it, when the text gives you the plan, it is normally talking about the plan at that level. Now it will tell you about different steps out, in, in and out, different projections. Uh, you mustn't think that because it doesn't mention the recesses that there are no recesses. Because if you look at that drawing on the left, you'll see that the, the kura sticks out and then it steps in to the, the kumbha and the other moldings of the Vedipanda. And then it sticks in again for the wall the janga, the thigh, and then it steps out again to the second level for the for the the mouldings of the varandika, the cornice, and the little shikara on the top. And although those two inner levels are stepped in from the kora, so by the as you're moving up within each element, you can see that the recesses appear by necessity. 
Okay, <laughs> so the the plan doesn't the plan may not have the plan as given in the text may not have any recesses, but by the time you get up to the wall, it will have recesses because the 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 because the as as you go up the courses of masonry the moldings step in. Da, 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 da. So, but if you have two elements side by side, they're stepping in. By the time you get to there, there's a recess in between. So, as well as a tilikas, you also have a different kind of element in the middle. Very often it's like this. Some texts call it a simha karna, um, whatever they call it. Um, its origin goes back to the Vallabi type of temple, which um, ultimately derives from the barrel, barrel roofed Chaicha Hall type of building with its uh, hole in its half, which become gavakshas and, and they, they get woven into these these patterns and that's what that thing in the middle represents um, another an, uh, an edicule may representing um, a valabi type of temple as i say we'll focus on the aparajita pracha 12th century western india and um, on chapter 159 which is about the uh, 21 temples, 21 or 25? 25, 25 temples, uh, starting with Keshari and ending with Meru. The Keshari temple is an early form of Anik Andaka temple. Um, probably the temple, going back to that question about which came first, I'm sure that they were starting to build these temples in the in the ninth century before they were written about in a text. But it when the it, 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 it turns out that this uh, this form um became established as the first of this the, a series which appears in a number of texts and it's an interesting series because you can see how the texts and the practice evolve side by side and so so you find it in the, the you find uh, these 25 temples in the Samarangana Sutradhara in the 11th century. Um, and they, you can see that that's they, thinking in kind of 10th or 11th century terms in the way they talk about the design. By the time you get to the Aparajita Pracha, it's, um, it's moved on, the text has moved on as has the practice and you get a lot of more complicated uh, temple types that have been worked out by then. But to go, to go back to this, the, the most basic, the Keshari, um, it's one, it's a, a single shikara on the top, like a Latin temple, one of those Vallabi things in the middle, and kutas tambas, little, little shikaras on pillars uh, at the corner. Uh, you can, see, drawn from the text, you'll see uh, an ambulatory around the sanctum, so, uh, because these in these um, series of uh, temples in the text, they they they're talked about as sandhara temples, temples with an inner ambulatory, in inner pradakshina pata. But um, in reality, you don't, they don't all all have such things. It's an option, and the the way the ambulatory is drawn in the plan is not necessarily uh, what you would. You know, the, the proportions of all that are not necessarily what you would find in practice, which doesn't matter. It's, what's interesting here is the it's the outside form and composition. Now, the the Keshari is known as Panch Andaka. It's got five Andas. And the Andas, the eggs, are the Amalakas and the finial on top, the, that, that uh, ribbed crowning member um, capped by a pot, finial, finial. So when these days it says five andakas, it's the one on the top and the four little ones at the corner. Now those tilakas that I showed you, they don't count as andakas, which is part of the rules of the game. The game of this 20, 25 temples is to get from five andakas to 101. So the Meru temple has 101 Andakas. So each successive type has to have four more andakas. 
Second in the series is called Sarvato Bhadra. And Sarvato Bhadra is one of those popular temple names, and you'll find it in other texts, meaning something different from this. But it's a recurrent name for number two in this series of 25 temples. And it's a simple development from the Keshari, the Keshari in a very archetypal way of, de of developing in Indian temple architecture, the uh, simpler form becomes the top of a more complicated one. So the, the Keshari becomes the top of the Sarvato Bhadra. The Vallabhi thing in the middle goes blah, 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 and the corner kutas, you get one, two, one, two, going down at the corners. And the example I've shown you um, there is, is a Sandhara temple, does have an ambulatory, and that's why you get those um, grills, those jali screens in the Bhadra, bringing light into the Pradakshina Pata. So the Sarvata Bhadra temple is Navandaka, it has nine Andakas. Those actually appear before this kind of quintessential uh, Shekari temple. Now, sh the term Shekari, you won't, Daki popularized it, um, the term, for um, the multi spired type of temple. I, he didn't say, and I don't know if I never asked him when I had the chance, which text did he get the term? From and he's never he never wrote it down. But so it's and, and it's not it's a bit of a, uh, we're kind of free to to to, to choose our own definition of shakery. It the, the term relates to shikaras, but when does a thing stop being simply anekandaka and also become shakery? Well, let's say my definition for what it's worth is it's shik, call it shakery when you have a little when the middle element is a small shikara, a small latina shikara. So you have a, a, the, a, a small version of the whole temple appearing on the chest of, of the central element. So this would be the most very, most simple shake, uh, shikari, which is uh, well, Navandaka, nine andakas, nine little um, Nine, nine Amalakas crowning small shikaras. You get a sense that the small ones are projecting out, expanding out from the center. And as things develop through the 10th and 11th centuries, the, the walls progressively step out. I'm just telling you all the, some basic things you need to know before we come to the text so you can understand when we get to the text, you'll uh, you'll you'll immediately be able to see what it's talking about. So uh, the, the walls it, it progressively step out more and more to a stage where the corners and the intermediate element, the pratiratas, come into line so that you get a kind of stepped diamond plan. You can draw a straight line across the corners. And having done that, we get the opportunity of a little putting in that little angle. I don't know if you can see on the photo on the right, between the corner and the, the thing as either side, there is just another tiny a little huta stampa with a little shikara poking out in that angle on the first first bumi first tier first story and you can see it happens again on the second story this is one of the cases where uh, practice is more subtle and complicated than the theory that you find in the text because in the text, they never talk about those little things hidden in the recesses. Uh, they do talk about them when they stick out. When they're sticking out, we'll see it in a minute. And they give them a name, which is a Nandi or a Nandika. 
But these are kind of hidden, almost hidden away Nandikas, just embedded in the body of the temple and just poking through within the recess. So if you look at the, uh, the, this, this shikara, you can see they perform a very interesting function when, as you start to get more complex, because at a certain stage, you, as well as these half shikaras, sometimes called uh, ura shringas, the half ones that you see emerging along the cardinal axes, you also get quarter ones in the angles, so that the work for emerging from one happens at a smaller scale as you go out and down. Having started this process, then the, the, the architects, as the tradition develops, draw out the, the different possibilities of the architectural system and create more and more complex designs within the basic rules in such a way that the, as things develop, the earlier temple forms become subsumed within more complicated temple forms, which, as you can see, proliferate, expand, and emanate downwards and outwards, so that in a complicated temple, the, the sense of dynamism you get, the, the sense of, of all these um, small uh, microcosm, right, microcosmic ele elements um, manifesting forth and emerging and expanding and, and emanating out from the, the center, um, that, 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 that same pattern of movement that you see uh, almost happening before your eyes in one of those complicated temples, actually uh, contains the stages of development through the tradi tradition within the single design, because the earlier ones are there, progressively becoming the top of something more complicated. Now, that same way of thinking of emanatory sequences of increasingly complicated designs, of drawing one design forth from another, uh, is there in this chapter 159 of the Aparajata Pracha, and indeed of all these different texts which have the 25 temples starting with Keshari. Um, and, and in the I've written about this. Still, things take so long to to come out, but some some one day some articles will come out which explain all this all this stuff. Um, I've looked at all the, the uh, I've looked at these these texts, and you do you see that it, in the Aparajita Pracha, um, it, it's not doing exactly the same as architectural history does, but it's absolutely thinking in the same way. How can we go from this design to another more complicated one? And several of those types uh, in in the um, in that emanatory sequence that we see in Western India through the 11th and 12th centuries are actually there described um, very well in the Aparajita Pracha. And as I say, each time we have to go, we have to add four more andakas. And in this drawing, I'm, I'm just showing you the, the basic change of plan. I'm not showing you all 25, but I'm showing you each time from Kesari to Sarvato Bhadra onwards, each time the plan changes um, and then the overall shape changes. And then within that envelope, they do fid they fiddle around with, you know, we need we not, we need to go from fifty three to fifty seven uh, andakas. So we take away some shringas and we put til or take away some tilakas and we'll put shringas instead, uh, and we'll add another ura shringa and we'll get to the required number. All now now you know everything you know to need to know to understand my worked example which is a, a temple type called, um, it's called Indranila. 
Indra Nila. I think in the Samarangana, the equivalent one is called Indra Lila. And in the Aparajata Pracha, it's the Indra Nila. But the, the names are more or less the same. The designs change from text to text as uh, because, as I say, they keep up with the times. So, uh, as ever, let's start with a bindu and give give it some um, some axes. The text says, "In a width of sixteen amshas." Now, as we saw, as I we, I said earlier, amshas, bhagas, badas, and various other terms. They all mean, they're not units of measurements, they mean a part. So in a width of 16 amshas, is it, 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 we know from um, uh, working on these things that we're talking about a square plan and it's got 16 parts. So we draw a square of 16 parts. It, it, it happens to be a grid, it's but it's actually less concerned with grids. It, it, it is a grid, but sometimes they subdivide, redivide. The, the real interest is that, that width and the number of parts. So in a width of 16 amshas, let's increase the size so you can see better, the karna is two bhagas wide. Bhagas, same as amshas. So the karna is the corner and we'll make it two. Easy. Then there is a nandika. That's why I told you about those funny little things hidden in the recesses. But here, the texts don't talk about them when they're hidden, but they do talk about them when they stick out. So here is a sticking out nandika, which is one bhaga. And a pratirata of two amshas, two parts. Once again, there should be a nandi of one bhaga. So we're moving from the corner towards the center, so it must be the next little bit. So one bhaga is a nandi or a nandika. And a bhadra of four amshas. See, they like to change between bhagas and amshas just for a bit of um, variety, you know, not always to use the, the same word. Uh, oh, well, that's lucky. We, we've got it right because you can see four gives us the Bhadra. Everything has ma matching projection. Now this, I, I, I cheated, you see, I looked ahead. You have to look ahead. I knew this already because I read it ahead. <clears throat> it's, I could have drawn the Pratirata with less of a projection. But I drew it the same width and the same depth uh, to make one of those stepped diamond plans that I showed you. So matching projection sometimes called, it, it was probably, I haven't put the Sanskrit there, it was probably samdala. Uh, so all the, all the dalas, all the petals are the same. Um, or it may, it may have said uh, the, the nirgama, the projection is all the same something like that. But we know it must be talking about, especially as we're, we're in, at a certain point in the sequence, and we know that already they started to use the, step, the uh, stepped diamond plan. So, okay, so the, the, the Karna and the Pratirata are in line, and the Karna and, and, and all the projections have the same width as they have a depth. The projection, in the Bhadra, the projection is one Bhaga, so I cheated, I looked ahead, I already got it one. Now we've got, a, we've got a little segment of the plan, but now we know everything we need to know for the outside form of the plan. So we can double it up and da, 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 da. there's your plan. There's half, a half plan of this temple. The Garbha is 64 bhagas. Now, We've got 16 from corner to corner. How can we get 64? If it had said 8 or 10, that would be okay. We could make, 
The Garbha is the Garbha Griha, the sanctum. How could we make, how can it be 64? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. eight, eight to 64. Must be eight like that. They must be 64 squares. Okay, so that's good. Enclosed by one bhaga of walls. Now, remember, it told us these are Sandhara temples with an Andharika or ambulatory. So the, that's one bar, a, a wall of one bhaga is going around here. The outer wall should be one bhaga, while the Brahmantika should be two. So the, uh, the Brahmantika, what, this is an example of where we have to know from the context, because we know, you know Pradakshinapata, Andhara, Andharika, those all mean an ambulatory. But a Brahmantika, what's a Brahmantika? I mean, I don't know what a Brahmantika is, but but I know it must mean it must be talking about the uh, ambulatory, the uh, Andharika, because of the context. We're looking at the plan, and this is where uh, so it must be like this. Okay. Look, the outer wall looks a little bit thin on the corner, but okay. I think if we were building it, we might. Uh, bend the rules a bit and probably it, you know the the central sanctum in an ambulatory would might well have some projections like that which we could probably add be that as it may a crucial thing to remember is that the plan which we've just been given is at the level of the kora at the hoof level so there will be recesses between the the different elements so we'll it'll step back twice from the hoof from the kura once to the the vedi banda and then again in in again to the wall to the main janga or wall section so we'll get once we get up to the wall we'll have recesses recesses like i've shown here in gray so now we've got we've done the talamana the the um the plan measurement now we're going to do the urdhvamana or the upper measurement so here's the plan um it's now i need to admit that the aparajita pracha in this chapter doesn't tell you the it gives you the it tells you the composition it doesn't give you the vertical heights I haven't found any, any other section in another chapter where it told you these things for this kind of temple. Fine, I'll, I, I will just do it by eye. Maybe the architect is free to do it, or maybe the, that bit's been lost. So I've drawn the heights by eye, but more crucial than the heights is what are the elements that go in the different parts of the plan into the shikara. Now, um, architects among you will know that uh, plans and elevations are conventions showing you a flat thing that in reality is in three dimensions. So we must, um, in thinking about what they're discussing, we have to be thinking not just in elevation, but in three dimensions. So I'm going to show you the plan of the shikara at the same time as I, I I work out the elevation. One should build two shringas in the karna, while the shikara, and I move, I need to read the bottom. Ah, that moves up. Great. You can even move all you lovely people up a bit, and I can see the bottom. Okay, one should build two shringas in the karna. Shringa, you'll remember, is a word used in this text to mean the, the kutas, the little shikaras, uh, on top of the different projections. So two shringas in the karna. Does that mean that there are two karnas and so each one has a shikara? Or probably, probably given the type of temple, uh-uh. Why doesn't it move on? There we are. 
two little two shringers in the corona like that which give us this in elevation stepping up we need to know that the corners of the upper little shikara sit the the controlling square never mind the ins and outs but the sort of underlying uh, square has its corner has its corner on the center of the one below while the shikara has the width a width like the sun's well, i should mention that it was mattia salvini that i who i worked with uh, on the sans the translation from the sanskrit in this case so the shikara has a width like the sun's uh, which mattia knew is that, that he knows that there are 12 suns um or maybe 12 stars or something so uh, a width like the sun means 12. So the shikara has 12, so it must be talking about that top shikara, the one, not the whole superstructure, but the one in the middle, because if we can't count, count the squares, we'll find a width of 12 goes very nicely uh, between the middle of the two shringas, which support the main shikara. There we are. In the Nandika, there is a Tilaka. In the Nandika, there is a Tilaka. In each Nandika, it must mean. Does it mean all of them? Or no, it means the one, I think it means the one next to where we, we've got to. So we give it a Tilaka, and that doesn't count as an Andaka when we come to count, because we know that the Indra Lila has to have 53 Andakas. And when we get to the end, if we've got 53, we know we've got it right. So that's a tilaka in, the, in there. The pratyanga is two bhagas. So what's a pratyanga? Oh, that, those, those are the tilakas in the nandaka. What's a pratyanga? Don't, well, it's going to be one of those little quarter shikaras nestling in the corner between the main shikara and the first Ura Shringa. Um, how do I know that? Not because I know what a Pratyanga means. This is my point about terminology. It doesn't, it's not that I know that it has, I have to put one of those quarter shikaras here because I look in the dictionary and it tells me a Pratyanga is that. That might be helpful. But I might not find it, or I might find a different meaning for pratyanga. But what I do know from because I've worked out it's this kind of temple they're talking about, is that the next thing they've got to tell us is that and what fits there. It's one of those. So it's from the architecture that I know that pratyanga means this, not that I know what the architecture is, because I know the meaning of pratyanga. And there are your pratyangas in the elevation. There are two shringas in the pratirata. So uh, that's the next pratirata. Okay. And now I'm looking, I'm, I'm adding them uh, uh, going backwards from the corner as well, because it's three dimensional. It's happening on all four sides conceptually. Of course, real temples have a doorway and they may have a shukanasa and a mandapa. So three sides are the same. One side is going to be a little bit different. But a prasada or a vimana, uh, a temple in these particular in, in the this kind of text is always conceived in an in an idealized way as a as a, as a symmetrical four five four sided figure. So. That's an, that when we count the andakas, that's what we're talking about—a uh, 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 a four-sided symmetrical uh, three-dimensional object. So, two shringas in the pratirata and an ura shringa of six amshas. Though no, those were my two shringas in the pratirata. Sorry, <laughs> ura shringa is. And, and we know it's right because look, six, we've got six spaces left, and we're so good. Ura Shringa of six amshas, and there it is. So we've got we've got one Ura Shringa. 
There are two Shringas in the Nandika. What does that mean? We had one Shringa in the other Nandika. One, uh, sorry, one Tilaka in the other. If we put two Shringas like we have on the Pratirata in the Nandika, they're going to end up touching each other in the middle and there's not going to be room for the next Ura Shringa. Oh my God, what does it mean? Two Shringas in the Nandi. Oh, it must mean like this. How about this? Look. And since I know some temples a bit like this, and I know they do that kind of thing, it must be okay. Let's see if it works. Two, so like that, little half shikaras, which are going to be embedded in the side of whatever comes in between. And an ura shringa of four amshikas, which is there. And it fits because we have four square left, four squares left. Here it is. A Bhadra Shringa of two Bhagas. Now the Bhadra Shringa must be the Shringa on the Bhadra. Okay. So that gives us three Ura Shringas going down. And we know there actually needs to be something around that it can't you can't just stop there because there's a space and we know from actual temples that there's going to be some sort of arrangement in front of that uh, badra shringa so i think we've done it indra lila this was the indra lila temple we count the andakas and he's got 53 andakas and we got it right now we can compare with practice and uh, using one of Kailash's scans of the Mahalaleshvara temple uh, at, um, at Asoda. We can compare a, an accurate elevation with the drawing that I've done. And you'll immediately see it's not ex it's very, very similar. It's what I call a type three in the sequence of basic underlying three dimensional shapes. Uh, but if you look very hard, you'll see the difference is the uh, the the actual temple, the actual example, which is a, a quite a common, beautiful, compact, um, uh, often repeated type doesn't have the little nandikas sticking out but if you look at the roof the drawing from the roof it has the little nandikas um, hidden in the recesses so you can test that by that, that drawing i did years ago by by looking looking at temples and photos and um, drawing from those it actually fits on the actual uh, roof plan. So the text is close, but the practice found something different uh, and follows that. Now, so to uh, to end with, I'm going to talk about a drawing. As we have seen, uh, tech drawing and texts are absolutely uh, interconnected. The texts, the way that these texts are, are presented assumes that you're going to draw. They say, trace this, draw that, construct that. And they only make sense if you draw as you, uh, as you go through the instructions. Now, it so happens that the last time I was in Rajasthan, which was four years ago, uh, we were at uh, Nagda, 10th century uh, temple complex known as the Sas Bahu, the mother and mother in daughter, mother in law and daughter in law temples. Very beautiful com complex. In fact, that uh, uh, basic Shekhari temple type that I showed you earlier 
is one of the subsidiary shrines surrounding the Sas temple, the mother-in-law temple. You know, there are quite a lot of sites where um, we have the architectural drawings on the ground. Bhojpur, that I've worked on a lot, is the famous one, because there the drawings are, are inscribed on the rock. Um, and so they've survived. They're very worn out, but they have survived on the rock. But in, there are many more temple sites where you find some drawings, fragments of drawings, on the paving, where it's the original paving around the temple, you'll see that the paving was the was like the drawing board and the uh, the, the, uh, the 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 point of reference for the architectural architectural drawings that the builders would have used when designing and when constructing the temples. Now, when we were there four years ago, suddenly. We, one of my uh, friends came across a drawing which nobody knew about before. I think the ASI have been replacing one or two of the slabs and people have been walking over and picnicking on the drawing for a thousand years uh, where from, since when they built the temple. And it's still there. And uh, so I said, oh, I'll go back next day. And it was the last, I only had one day to, to do it, and it was raining, and the, what, what, what we chalked on the day before got washed off. So I chalked on onto the drawing, uh, chalked over it so I could, you could see better. Uh, then I did a horrible sketch because time was short, and it, as you can see, it was raining. And I, and I put some measurements on it, and I also took photos of a tape measure so that I could check certain measurements. Now that's been, that drawing, uh, I'm very excited to show, I've been looking forward to show you because it's a world premiere of this drawing and ne never been seen before. I did. Uh, it's been sitting in my sketchbook for four years and I thought I'll do that, I'll do this drawing, work it out for this lecture. And the cat has been sitting on the drawing, uh, but nevertheless, I managed to, uh, from the, the drawing, scrappy as it is, uh, I, and, and the photographs, uh, I could redraw the drawing to scale and then trace over it the, the bits you can actually see because um, a lot, as you can see, a lot of bits are missing. And the whole thing looks like this. Uh, you, the scale is on the right, uh, so you can see it's about three and a half meters tall. It's actually full, uh, like uh, a lot of the ones at Bhojpur, it is a full-size working drawing. And you could, you, you could use it to take the dimensions off uh, as you construct the temple, and you could use it to, um, to, 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 to make the blocks of the, shik the little shikaras to get the curvature correct. So I can complete that, that drawing because it's, it's rather like, um, it's rather like doing a, a drawing from, the, from a text. I mean, completing the drawing is the same thing. If you, if you, if you have an idea, uh, if once you've worked out what kind of, uh, Shikara it's talking about, you know how to fill in the missing bits. So there we have a temple design that was kind of hidden there in the drawing. We can double it up and we get the, the entire Shikara. So the, the obvious question is, is it the... Um, is it what is it the sas or the bahu? And uh, well, it's a little bit smaller than either of them. And if you look closely, the composition is not exactly the same. It's similar, but the, the elements next to the vadra are different. It's got these little um, partly submerged uh, shikaras there. Um, it's actually got one more urashringa at the center, 
So it's it's uh, it's in the same vein, but it's different. You notice the temples themselves have um, a stone stone walls and then a brick superstructure again. So maybe it's the I don't know. Maybe it's the sister-in-law, or maybe they changed their minds um, and they you know as they went along and didn't follow the drawing exactly if anybody knows the site very well perhaps you you, you might have seen a, a, a some uh, the the the, uh, the the base of a temple that it may have been so do let me know it's both the existing temple and the drawing are similar to a type which i call poetically type three, where uh, you have um, a, a, a step to diamond plan and uh, those little uh, nandikas, hidden nandikas in between, which you do actually get on the Sas and the Bahu temple, but they are not, it, so it's very, they're very similar to this type three, but they don't have the stepped diamond plan. They, they don't have the sandala, the, 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 the corners, Although they look all the same, the corners and the pratira, the karanas and the pratiratas, the, the pratiratas are actually slightly narrower than the karanas. But they do have the nandis, which, if you can see on the top left, probably rather small, but they have little elephants sticking out rather than little shikaras. And uh, the type three is one of those uh, types which in the Aparajita Pracha is described um, very clearly, uh, corresponding very closely to the actual built examples. So I, 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 I wrote down, why did I show, why in a talk about text did I end with a drawing? I just scribbled some notes to remind me of why I did that. Oh yes, well, because texts and drawings, they, um, they reflect the same way of thinking. And as I've said, the texts expect you to draw as they give the instructions. They ex and, and probably this is how they uh, transmitted an understanding of the architectural tradition to the, uh, the, 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 the people who were becoming uh, architects and, and craftsmen. Because if, if if you had a it, it would be a, your job in uh, drawing from the text would be a lot easier if you had a guru uh, looking over your shoulder and you're reciting the text and internalizing it and you're drawing at the same time um, the guru would no doubt help the interpretation of the text but even without the guru I hope I have shown that you can you can uh, get to the drawing that it expects you to draw. Um, and the drawing, of course, is one step closer to the built reality, to the actual building. It's an intermediate stage between the text, if you are using a text, and the actual building. But, but, and this is the big but, you still have to, you still have to know the tradition, you still have to go beyond the text, indeed beyond the drawing, and fill in the details. We've got to, what it's given you is a skeleton, but we've got all the gavaksha patterns, all the pillar moldings, so many things, things it may have left out that you'll have to fill in. And the text is, as well as inviting you to draw, is inviting you to complete the thing. It, it's inviting you to interpret, to improvise, and to be, be creative in realizing the design of which it has given you the, the skeleton. And that's that's true. Of, in that way, I think a drawing like that um, is very close to the kind of thing that the texts are giving you. Um, and you, you, I thought I'd point out that there are different kinds of drawing, just as there are different kinds of text. I mean, the texts, they're all, the ones that are about temple designs, they're all aiming at the same thing, uh, giving a framework for the design of temples, but some give you more detail and some give you less. So some give you only the very bare framework and others give you, give you more than that. But no matter how much detail they give you, you've still got to 
know it, know the language, fill in all the details and invent new things, other things that the text didn't tell you. So just to, to illustrate how drawings are, 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 are like texts, drawings are, are of different kinds and give you different amounts of detail. The one over on the left is a, is a drawing of a Bhumija temple at Bhojpur, which beautifully gives you the very essential framework with the proportions between the different parts of the plan and the elevation. But you'll notice that the little shikaras are very charming, but they're not realistic. They're, they're, they're sort of a bit lopsided and and, and, and they're not, you, 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 if you built that, it would look very funny. Whereas the, in the one at Nagda, although I do question the, the sort of curvature of the top shikara, but otherwise you could actually, and I've measured it, they, they're at the, the, the bottom ones have uh, the radius is three times the base and all that kind of thing. So you could actually use those that one those ones as a template to set out the the, the height and the curvature of the shikaras. Um, but it's not like, for example, this drawing from Bhojpur, which is a which is a full scale uh, working drawing for mouldings for the uh, the pita the the sub base and the what remains is uh, it would no doubt no doubt have continued but what we, what survives is the the kumbha and the kura of a bhumija temple uh, and uh, you'll see it has elevational detail in it as well as sectional detail um, but you can't while it gives you all the dimensions and the profiles in it which you could use to make a template to make the stones and to start to build the, the the temple, uh, you still have to know how to interpret. You still have to know the language and to know which bit is elevation for the decoration on the surface, which bit is section, um, and so on. But you can see it's a it's a much more specifically detailed drawing than either of the ones to the left. Or this one, also at uh, Bhojpur, is uh, is a conceptual drawing. Uh, it's it's uh, it's an idea for an open pillared mandapa with a, 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 a sort of um, a kind of uh, samvarana roof with little uh, central Indian versions of Dravida kutas on the roof. But the, the the profiles are all a little bit wonky, and it has a kind of freedom to the line that shows that it's more to the, more a kind of a sketching out an idea type of drawing. So in text and in drawings, we have to, there are different degrees of detail. We have to know the architecture. We have to complete it. We have to improvise and invent. And another thing is that, that, that in, in both that, that, that drawing and the texts both uh, exemplify is that there are these potential designs kind of hidden there. And the architect then has to realize them through the through the, the through that next stage of thinking and design and then of course through the actual stage of building and getting the material and getting paid for it and, and doing what the client was what wants and telling the, telling the client he won't go to heaven or get rich if he doesn't do it just like this and he might have his idea or, or she might have all those things that are involved with actually you know, making the thing as it actually was, is. Uh, these are just, to, to, I'm nearly finished, uh, to say, well, texts are themselves are inventive and creative and contain designs that um, have never been built. Great flights of imagination, like this Navatmaka temple from the Samarangana Sutradhara, which is very complex. And if you sat, if you decided, yes, we will build that, that you would have to do an awful lot of further work and you would create something that the probably as an individual architect you would never have thought of and in that way it's rather like 
some of the miniature temples of a similar period in in uh, Karnataka, where uh, very inventive, never built ideas for temples are created by the craftsmen in the miniature temples that they uh, that are carved over the niches uh, of the temple wall. And uh, in those miniature miniature temples, just as in a text, you haven't got a client and you haven't got to think, how do I actually build it? So maybe you can be freer and more inventive than you often can when things have to be more realistic. And finally, when we're talking about hidden designs, which you have to find um, and discover, they're also there, as I hope, I think you will have sensed, within the architectural tradition itself. Um, through the way, the way of thinking, which draws out one design from another, through, through an, a, a complicated architectural system that has certain potential, certain inherent ideas that are there once the system has been set, set up, but which have to be drawn out and explored and which you can find, which in a way, which in a, it sounds absurd, but those designs exist in the, in the medium, in the tradition, before anybody has built them or before anybody has even written, thought about them and written the, about them in a text and drawn them. Pulling out one design from another. And uh, I, I hope you, one of the lessons uh, that I hope to, to um, have put across is that uh, understanding architectural text is not, is not it can't be done just through words. That uh, if, as, as architects know, uh, to, the best way to understand something is to draw it. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. That was magisterial. It was. Uh, it was magisterial. I mean, there's nothing. Sh it's nothing short of that. It's uh, what a <laughs> what a cosmic effort. <laughs> well, I hope it wasn't too <laughs> much. I thought I'll try and make it very no, clear. No, you have <laughs> simplified it as much as anybody could. <laughs> and I don't see how something as complex as this could have been uh, could could have, could have been simplified. You've tried to put in every single component. You've broken it down to the essential alphabets, really, and uh, and tried to then say how these alphabets create different languages. And but of course there are uh, hundreds of varieties within the subcontinent and. Uh, it is uh, interesting to know uh, that, I mean, even, I mean, you took, you looked at Aparajita picture and you're looking at Samaranga and Sutradhar. There must have been texts. What about texts which were non Sanskrit? Were the texts written in vernacular? There, there, there are. Uh, and and, and this, this is one of the, I suppose, one of the questions is uh, if, if these are as, um, as I was trying to argue if these are not purely theoretical and divorced from practice, uh, how come they were in Sanskrit, not in the vernacular? Um, and I, I, I think, uh, and th there are some vernacular ones, mm -hmm. from certainly from Western India, and there are, there are texts in Tamil as, as well, as well as Sanskrit texts from South India. Uh, which are definitely close to practice and you know more for for the people actually building to 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 use um and i think the the sanskrit texts are an indication of the the elite status that architecture had in the in the medieval period, and and how it was, how Vastu Shastra architecture was was brought into the uh, the kind of 
into the status of, 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 a, of one of the branches of knowledge that it was important to know and it was important for kings to uh, to have books about and so yeah. on. Even if they didn't, you know, read it as their bedtime <laughs> reading, it was yeah, considered exactly. important and, and, and Stapetes uh, would become important people, uh, mm not the poor devils who did the hard the hard work but the stuff that he became somebody with with status and uh, you know interacted with the priest and with the with the pa with the patron whether the patron was the you know and in some pa cases the patron was the, was the king and the texts perhaps assume more than um the, the te texts perhaps give a, the impression that of, of uh, patrons being particularly elite uh, well, of course, on the whole, they were. Uh, but it, it, I, 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 you, I do wonder whether the, sans, the the translation into Sanskrit and the writing down wasn't part of this uh, the sort of um, process of making architecture and an, an, something that an, 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 an elite branch of knowledge, but that. If these, uh, if the stupidities were also becoming important at the same time, you know, they would be see, speaking Sanskrit and keen to show that they did. Certainly, the text, these texts, the Sanskrit texts, weren't um, weren't written by somebody who didn't know the architecture. The ritual parts and other parts could well have been, but the, it's very clear. I hope it became clear in the talk that yes, the, the texts are, are about thinking about actual buildings, uh, and some of and some some stupidities would surely have been building and writing. It wasn't, you know, and the people who wrote those things were were drawing. They were showing people how to draw, and it was totally uh, a dialectical thing with with uh, with building practice. But whether whether there was whether the less elite temple traditions had uh, all had texts, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm certainly not saying that you have to have a text in order to build a temple. I, I you have to have a you have to have, or as we as as we can as we uh, can tell from these the buildings, they are very formal, uh, co uh, structured. Uh, uh, they are a very formal and structured art form, with huge room for invention within within those very um, oh. formal structural rules, and that's part of the joy of them is that all the things you can do within within those rules. So the st the structured system was there, uh, whether or not you had a text, and so um, it could be that 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 uh, the the most poetic and and Sanskrit texts uh, are just mm -hmm. the very the of the very elite remnants of something that was more, you know, yeah. which which was which had different different degrees of uh, of sophisticated high high culture. But it's it's still a reflection of. It, my main point is that they are a reflection of something which is to do with the the nitty gritty of practice, even if. A little bit separate from actual building and more to do with conceptual design which then has to be translated into actual buildings. 